Dear classmates, welcome to the VLSI testing class. Today we are going to introduce a new topic, Design for Testability or DFT. This is our cross row map. From now on, the second half of this class is going to introduce important test techniques from the designer's point of view. The first topic we are going to introduce for designers is DFT, Design for Testability. The concept of DFT forms important foundation for the following lectures such as built-in self-test and the test compaction. So every designer has to know something about DFT. Here is our motivating problem. In our sequential ATPG lecture, we failed to generate test pattern for this fault because this fault will propagate to FreeFab2 and the fault effect cannot reach to any primary output no matter how many cycles of clocks. So your manager asks you to add some circuits so that this fault can be detected to improve the fault coverage. So can we change the free flop design to improve the controllability or observability? This is a very important problem because all the useful circuits are sequential circuits. So why am I learning this chapter? Design for testability helps designer to make ATPG easier and to improve the full coverage and the test quality. It also reduced test length and the test cost. Here is a very good quotation. It goes, good design is obvious, great design is transparent. For DFT, we hope that the DFT is transparent to the users and the designers as well. DFT is an important topic, so we will divide this topic into two parts. In this part, we are going to have an introduction about DFT, and then we will show the internal scan DFT techniques, including free flop based and the latch based DFT. In the second part of DFT, we will introduce external scan techniques. For example, the famous JTAG 1149.1 standard. So, what is DFT? DFT means that we insert circuitry that has little to do with the functionality. But DFT improves the testability of the circuit including controllability and observability. So why do we need DFT? The number one reason is to reduce ATPG effort so that ATPG runtime is shortened. Second reason is to improve the test quality. With DFT, we can improve the fault coverage. The third reason is to reduce the test cost. With DFT, we can shorten test length and uh, the test time. Lastly, with DFT, we can reduce time to market. Circuits with DFT is easier to debug and diagnose. However, DFT is not free. To implement DFT, there are penalties. First of all, designers has to pay extra efforts to run DFT tools. And the second, DFT cause performance degradation. For example, if we insert marks into the circuit 
in our motivating problem, then there is one extra max delay on the signal path. The third penalty is hardware overhead. As we can see in this example, we need extra area for this MUX DFT circuitry. We also need extra pins for the DFT. Number four penalty is yield loss. Because circuits with DFT is bigger, that means the yield is lower. And the last but not the least is power overhead. Since the DFT circuit costs area overhead, it also consumes power. Although the DFT circuit is used only once during the test, however, it consumes power all the time. Somebody says this can be regarded as power tax of testing. DFT was invented around 1970s. At that time, the silicon was very expensive and the design was very simple. So DFT was not widely popular for all the designs. However, with the advance of CMOS technology, silicon is cheaper and cheaper and our design has become more and more complex. So DFT has become necessary for modern designs. Now it's time for a simple quiz. Which of the following statement is not true about DFT? A. DFT reduce designer's effort. B. DFT costs extra hardware and the power. C. DFT reduce test cost, so it's needed for complex design. Which is not true. Have you got it correctly? The answer is A. DFT actually require more designer's effort. Inserting DFT circuit may not be trivial. Now, let's introduce the first part of DFT, the ad hoc DFT. So what does ad hoc mean? According to Webster's Dictionary, ad hoc means for the particular end or case at hand without consideration of wider application. So ad hoc DFT means a DFT technique for particular design. This DFT technique is not generally equitable to all the designs. Ad hoc DFT relies on good design practice learned from experience. For example, here are some ad hoc DFT rules. Rule 1. Design circuits that can be easily initializable. Rule 2. Disable internal clocks during test. Rule 3. Partition large circuit into small blocks. Rule 4. Insert test point into circuits of low testability. This slide shows two examples for rule 1. On our left hand side, we have a free flop which has an active low reset pin. When we power up the circuit, this signal will be charged from 0 to VCC. So, when we power up this circuit, the free flop will be initialized automatically. On our right hand side, this free flop has two reset signals 
One is coming from the internal logic. The other one is coming from the external tester. When we are testing this circuit, we can directly control this flip-flop from the tester. This slide shows an example for rule number two. Typically, we have internal clock from on-chip PLL. In normal operation mode, we apply this clock to the circuit. However, in test mode, the control signal is one. We don't like internal clock. In test mode, we prefer to apply the clock from the tester so that we can directly control the operation of the circuit under test. One important ad hoc DFT technique is test point insertion. The objective of test point insertion is to insert test points to enhance the controllability and the observability of the circuit. There are two types of test points. One is the control point, the other one is the observation point. This slide shows examples of control points. Suppose the original signal is X. If we want to control the value of X to zero in test mode, then we insert a DFT end gate to the circuit. In test mode, we apply a zero from primary input or a scan free flop so that the signal X is controlled to zero in test mode regardless of the original input. On the contrary, if we want to control X to one in test mode, then we insert a DFT OR gate here. In test mode, we apply a 1 and X will be controlled to 1 in test mode. We can do the same thing for an inverter output X. If we want to control X to 0, we insert a NOR gate. In test mode, we apply a 1 so X would be controlled to zero. If we want to control X to one, we insert a NAND gate. We can do the same thing for the AND gate output or the OR gate output. The detail of a scan free flop can be seen in our next video. This slide shows another way to insert control point. Suppose that node A, B, and C are circuit nodes with low controllability. If we want to control these signals in test mode, we can cut the original connection and uh, connect the source to the input of this control point free flop, which is a scannable free flop. The DI input represent a data input, and the DO data output is connected to the original destination. In normal operation mode, when Tm is equal to zero, we will connect the original source 
to the original destination. In this way, the value of node B is the same for the destination and the source. However, in test mode, when Tm is equal to 1, the destination will be connected to the scan free flop and the contents of this scan free flop can be shifted in from the scan input SI. In this way, the values of A, B, and C are controlled by free flop 1, 2, and 3 respectively. This is a simple way to insert control points to the circuit. Now it's time for a small quiz. In our previous slides, we said that in test mode, if we want to control x to 0, we can apply a 1 here. So, what are the control values in normal mode? Please fill in the values of the question mark. Are you done yet? This one should be easy. In normal mode, the question mark should be zero, so that this is simply an inverter. In normal mode, this question mark should be one, so this is just an inverter. Have you got them correctly? This slide shows an example of observation points for sequential circuits. Suppose node A, B, and C are of low observability and we want to observe their values in test mode. So we connect signal A B and C to the data input pins of observation point 1, 2, and 3 respectively. When scan enable is equal to 0, this mux would select the data input When we pulse one clock, the values of A, B, and C will be captured in the free flop. After that, we raise the signal scan enable to one, and uh, we pulse three clocks. When scan enable is 1, the scan input is connected to the free flop. So we can shift out the content in three free flops to observe the values of A, B, and C at the scan output. The details of scan can be seen in our next video. So test point insertion seems to be a very good DFT technique. However, test points are not free. There are some penalties. Number one, test points cause performance degradation. As we can see from this example, there is one extra mark between the source and the destination. So the design with DFT is lower than the original design. Second, we have extra area overhead. 
based on the rule of thumb, there is one test point for every 1,000 gates. Number three penalty is pin overhead. As we can see, we have extra pins in the design with test point. Number four, we need to know where to insert test points. To do this, we need to calculate the testability measure of the circuit. Number five, test point insertion is particularly important for built-in self-test to improve the full coverage. Please see the BIS chapter for more details. In summary, in this video, we have introduced the concept of DFT. DFT helps to improve the controllability and observability of the circuit. Ad hoc DFT is based on experience. The advantage is that it is suitable for our design under test. However, it is not a systematic way to insert DFT. If it cannot be systematic, then we don't have good EDA tool. This is different from structural DFT where automatic solution is available. So structural DFT is preferred to ad hoc DFT. Finally, we also introduced the concept of test point insertion. This solution has good EDA tools ready for use. So this is a very popular DFT technique. Before we end this video, we have a FFT for you. In the control point slide, we said that if we want to control the end gate output to zero, we can insert a DFT end gate. If we want to control the OR gate output to one, we can insert a DFT OR gate. So what should we do if we want to control the end gate output to one? What should we do if we want to control the OR gate output to zero? Please think about it. The answer should be quite straightforward. Thank you for listening.